welcome everybody to Titus. Woo! Uh, today we are actually, we lied. I didn't, we didn't mean to lie, but we lied. Um, we're actually not doing Titus, we're doing Genesis. No, I'm kidding. Uh, and we said that it was going to be an eight week study and then we were like, you know, we're gonna be a week behind Vanessa's group. They're starting next week. We like to do sort of an intro week and they don't really have an intro week. So you know what, we're gonna throw an intro week in there. So the eight week study has turned into a nine week study. We may throw in an extra week now and again. I don't know, stuff happens. I can't be held accountable for the extra <laughs> weeks that just get stuffed in. I don't know, things are gonna happen. Uh, so, welcome to Titus. I'm probably gonna say welcome to James at some point because we just finished James. And you're gonna be like, we're not in James anymore, it's Titus. I know. So, my name's Mariah. Welcome to Bible study. Um, we're gonna go around and eventually we're gonna say names. We're gonna get to know each other a little bit. At the end, we're gonna do some icebreakers, get to know each other really well, move around the room, get sort of loosened up. Um, we're, we're gonna say that's what we know. Uh, we're going to do an introduction to the book of Titus itself. We're gonna go do an introduction to the Chip Ingram book. We're gonna do an intro to how we're gonna run the study and sort of how each class is going to work. And then we're gonna spend the end, again, going over some sort of icebreaker activities and then prayer, it's gonna be great. So we will again have time to sort of mix and interact and have a little bit of an icebreaker later on, but we're gonna sort of do an overview of Titus because now some of you who have been here before, this is a little pop quiz. Whenever we do something new, if you're new and if you are new, the pop quiz does not apply to you, don't feel any pressure. But if you've been here before, feel pressure. Um, we're diving into something new, a new book, a new passage, a new verse, we don't want to come at it just straight, fresh. We want to look at something first. What do we want to look at? Context! Hey, okay. <laughs> hey, plus, all around. I'm so proud, I can't, I just can't. So, just like Pastor Jeff said on Sunday, uh, whenever we go into the scripture, we don't want to try to modernize it. We want to go back ourselves and say, hey, what was the culture like? Why were they writing? Who were the people that were involved? What was the language? What are the customs? And sort of get back into that time frame so that we can understand it as it was originally intended to be understood and sort of then bring general principles over into our modern day context so that we can apply those truths to our lives. And so we're gonna briefly go through all of these different points of context up on the screen. We're gonna hit each one. If I don't talk too, too long, then We'll have lots of time for our icebreaker at the end. Hmm. The first thing that we're going to go over is the literary genre. When we were talking about literary genre, it's a big phrase, but it's basically just, hey, is this a prophecy? Song. Is this uh, a New Testament book that's just written, or is this a letter? Is this uh, a book of history, or you know, is it a poem? So whenever we're in the New, New Testament, a letter is, you know, a, a fancy word for it is just an epistle. So. It's an epistle. We just did James. James is also an epistle, if you remember. So we're looking for a lot of the same things. The format is very similar. We start off in Titus with a salutation. Um, the author will give a, hey, this is who I am. We're jumping ahead a little bit, but it's Paul. So he says, hey, this is who I am. He says, um, it's interesting. Paul has this interesting little preamble. He says that he's writing for the sake of the elect. Now, every time we, we hit election or predestination, we tend to want to skirt around it because election is sort of, well, tricky. But today we are, we're going to talk about it briefly. Um, now, Berean's doctrinal statement does not take one solid position one way or the other regarding election, predestination, or free will. Uh, and the pastoral staff have different leanings. So some of them, if you talk to them, will you'll find lean a little bit more toward predestination and sort of God determining things ahead of time sort of side. And some of them will lean the other way a little bit more towards free will um, or trying to hold both to God's sovereignty and to free will. Um, so as we talk about these different options, just know that uh, the, they are both these, both of these ideas are both rooted in scripture. And so I'm gonna present two views. They're both valid, they're both scripturally based. I do lean toward one more than the other and I'll explain why. Uh, but if you are like, you know what? 
I strongly vehemently disagree with that. That's okay because we have past our pastoral staff has different ideas on this on these ideas as well. So the first view of what Paul is talking about whenever he says writing to um, writing for the sake of God's elect is that he's writing to people who are predestined. You guys have probably heard this term before. Predestined basically means I picked you and I have not picked you. I picked you, but not you. <laughs> in, in, inherent in this idea of predestination is that God, before time even began, selected some people to go to heaven and some people not to go to heaven. And so this view emphasizes God's sovereignty and it uh, basically sort of downplays free will. You may have heard the term irresistible grace before in thinking about different views of on Calvinism. And so the idea is that, well, could could God's will really be foiled by mankind? Like if it's his will that all should be, that people should be saved, how could we really resist him? So they say God's will is not resistible. Now you, I've already give, given away my, my hand. Um, I'm saying they, so I, I don't hold to this view. Um, there are a couple of problems with this view. Uh, one is that it makes God seem sort of like a moral monster because he's picking people to go to heaven and picking people not to go to heaven. Um, people would counter this by saying we justly all deserve hell and that is a true statement and so it is only out of his mercy that any are saved now again I, I still struggle with with that view I, I don't take that view so but that's how people who hold this will defend it and if you're like oh that's me that is one way to defend it um, another problem with this view is that it basically takes man's free will and gets rid of it and it makes it very much out to be more of a we're sort of following the flow of God's preordained plan and it, it makes it, it it's hard it's hard for me to get behind a, a view of life that takes out will that takes out responsibility and again I, there are defenses for this view that sort of try that explain hey no there is there is free will and it's still involved it's just God but for me, this view makes free will hard. The other position is that the elect is essentially the church, those who have freely chosen to accept God's gift of salvation. Uh, in this view, God is still ultimately <laughs> sovereign, but in his sovereignty, he created a world that gives people real freedom. So we have the ability to accept God or to reject him. And he, in his sovereignty, has said, Either option is okay. Um, now, in this view, we would say that God does foreknow those who would accept him, but his knowledge of who would accept him doesn't force people to either accept or not. Now, sometimes we have a hard time grasping that because we're in time. And so in our mind, if somebody knows what you're going to do ahead of time, then how could it not make you do it? But God is outside of time. So if you think about us right here, right now, does God know what we're doing right now? Sure. Of course, right? Now, do you feel pretty free right now? Mm -hmm. You feel yeah. free. Does, does your knowledge that God knows what you're doing make you think, oh, God's forcing me to do this? No. God sees the future like he sees right now because he's outside of time. Crazy. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> so he's outside of the book. He can go to any place in the book, all places in the book, at once, and read them as now. We can't. We're stuck on page 10329, or whatever page number we are in God's book of history, right? So we can only go linearly. We see things in time, but he's outside of time. And so for, for me, God's foreknowledge doesn't, I'm like, yeah, that's sure. Sure, he knows, but we still have free will. Freedom, human freedom is not canceled. So, again, in this view, God is not a moral monster type of thing. He's allowing people to make free decisions, and free will is still free. So I do like this view better. It's just the elect are the people who have chosen to follow God, and so, therefore, they are the chosen because they have accepted him. Um, again, if you're like, nah, uh, no, I think that option one works better. That's totally fine. It's all still referring to Christians. 
they're both both views are biblically based so um if you want to talk about this more later feel free but for now we're going to move forward continue talking about the format because we only got through the introductory salutation um, we're always going to have some type of main body we're going to talk about what the body looks like in a moment um, but then we're going to see some sort of personal closing usually now, if you guys remember who are in James, does James have a personal closer? No. James just sort of ends with his closing exhortation. And he's like, save a soul from hell. And you're like, cool. Great. Thanks, James. Uh, Paul's letters are all very standardized. He uses a format beginning and the end. So in, in his letter to Titus, he's going to have some final instructions going to give some final greetings, tell Titus, hey, greet these people over here, and then he's actually going to give a closing benediction. So whenever we're going through, keep that in mind, that's sort of the general format of an epistle, which we will see throughout the rest of the New Testament that that's more standard whenever you're thinking about letters. Now, what are we looking for with the knowledge that this is an epistle, this is a letter? Once again, like in James, we're looking for a logical flow of ideas with transitions. He's writing with sort of a central idea or two in mind, and he's going from thought to thought to thought. Again, it's not all necessarily going to perfectly connect, but we're looking for some type of logical training, and we're looking for those key transition words. So we're thinking of therefore, or in conclusion, referencing back, or you know things like that. So there's a whole bunch of words that we're looking for to help us know that we're moving from one idea to a new one. You guys get the idea. Uh, we're looking for some direct instructions. Uh, Paul is writing to Titus, one person to another, and he's an apostle writing to somebody that he set in charge, which we'll talk about again in just a moment. So he's not just telling a story. He's not writing a poem. He's not doing prophetic words. He's telling commands. He's saying, hey, do this do that, watch out for this. So it's all very, as you'll see up there, readily applicable. So it's something that you can sort of look at and say, oh, he said do this, I can also go ahead and do that. However, because Paul, an individual, is writing to Titus, another individual, who was in Crete in early, early AD, their contexts are different. And so it's very personalized and very <laughs> context specific. Not all of the commands, but many of them. So we still have to do the work of what does it mean in the original context, pull out the general principle, and pull it over to our context, because there's some things that, uh, you know, Paul's going to say, so those Cretes, you know, that they're all lying scumbags, you know, and we're like, well, we don't we don't work with Cretes. So does this verse apply to me? No, it doesn't apply. No, it does. It does apply to us. But we just have to take that general principle and pull it forward. So that's the sort of overview of the literary genre. Let's move forward and talk about the author. The author is, of course, Paul. Um, like in the last book that we studied, James, uh, the author self-identifies. Hey, this is Paul. And uh, he says he's a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is, again, similar to what James says. He says he's a servant of God. But Paul throws in this extra word here. He says he's an apostle. So let's take a look at that word for just a moment here. The word apostle or apostolos. Now, for those of you who have returned, do I speak Greek? No. 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 So, those of you who are new, if I try saying a Greek word, am I pronouncing it correctly? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I may not try to pronounce the word. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Sometimes it's helpful to at least try to say it so that you can have it in your head. It's helpful to go back to the Greek so that you can dive into the nitty gritty of what the language says. <laughs> so the word apostle means sent one. Or in this day and age, it was especially an official representative who was charged with some type of commission. They had a special task. Now, specifically in the New Testament, the term refers to one of the official apostles of Jesus. Now, how many apostles did Jesus start with? Twelve. Twelve. Then we had an unfortunate incident with Judas, where he betrayed Jesus and then commits suicide. So, we're down to eleven. I know. I know. You're just like, mm -hmm. this, is, this, is, this is awkward. So, now we're down to eleven. 
And the rest of the apostles go, you know what, 12 is a really important number. It you know, represents Israel, and I think that we're supposed to have 12. The next action item, we're going to replace Judas. So let's draw lots. And so they drew lots, and they chose Matthias to replace Judas. So now we're back up to 12. 12. So what's up with Paul? Because he would make 13, right? So how do we have 13 apostles? Well, uh, Paul was added whenever he spent some time with Jesus. Apparently, Christ spent some time ministering especially to him, and he called Paul to be an apostle specifically to the Gentiles, those of non-Jewish descent. Now, of course, he would have ministry as well to Jews, but he was specifically tasked with bringing the message of the gospel to the Gentiles. Which would be Paul. So let's talk a little bit more about Paul and his background. Uh, he is from Tarsus, which is a prosperous city and center of education in Asia Minor. Mom, I confess this morning you weren't there that I, I don't really remember any location. So if that paints a picture in your head, I'm happy for you. Uh, <laughs> it's not on our continent. It's not on our continent. It's, it's closer to Israel than we are. So it's Good job. not good. That is low key. Anyway, so early on, uh, Paul uh, inherited Roman citizenship from his parents. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we'll see Paul sort of whip out his Roman citizenship from time to time and be like, hello, citizen here. And you see the Roman <coughs> official sort of back it off. He's like, oh, it's a, it's a citizen. Sorry. <laughs> so he was able to take advantage of that. Um, he received rabbinic training by Gamaliel, who was a really um, big deal in that time. You'll see him show up in scripture as well. Uh, he was a very zealous Pharisee, so he, you'll see him in the gospel, not the gospels, in the different letters sort of saying again and again how zealous he was for that um, rabbinic training, and he was really earnest in that pursuit, and then of course he gets, he gets saved. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. Um, he has two names, Saul, which is his Hebrew name, and Paul, which is his Greek name. Sometimes you'll hear people saying, oh, Paul was his name for whenever he got saved. And that's not, it's not a quite accurate, it's just Saul was Hebrew and Paul is the Greek form. Um, and it just happens that they were in the sort of more Greek Gentile areas and he, they chose to use his, his Greek name. I don't know. So um, sometimes, again, you'll, you'll hear people say, oh, Saul was just because that's be who he was before he met Christ. Um, and it's certainly possible that he chose to dissociate from that identity and chose to more affiliate himself with the new, with the different identity, but they're very close. So it's not mm -hmm. like he's like, name change, I'm going to go by Zechariah. So it's, they, they were, they're just very inconsistent names. Um, he, of course, was a tent maker. And you see that showing up throughout the gospel, not the gospel. Why do I keep saying the gospel? It's because we're also working on the chosen. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Uh, we're, also, we're also working on the chosen. But Paul, throughout his letters, references that he is uh, a tent maker, and so we'll see him telling different churches, hey, you know, you didn't have to support us because we were working and doing the whole missionary shtick while we were still working, so you guys didn't have to sacrifice for us so that the gospel could be free for you. And so we see that theme over and over again with Paul. And, of course, we know that Paul persecuted violently the early church, and he spent some time, um, you know, he was there whenever Stephen died, approved of, of his execution, and then he was going around breathing murderous threats against the church. And then, of course, he receives a vision on the road to Damascus, and he meets the resurrected Christ, and he goes, oh, snap, I was wrong, yo. <laughs> and so he has a total 180 flip, takes all of that zeal and passion that he had for his uh, Pharisaic training, and he just pours it right into following Christ, and he goes all out. So he takes missionary journeys. He took at least four that we know of. He could have done more. We don't know. But he did at least four. Um, he's featured prominently in the book of Acts. Acts isn't all about Paul, but he does pop up quite a bit. He interacted with Luke a lot, and so you'll see those them interacting and sort of 
Luke recording a lot of those missionary journeys. Throughout the different epistles as well, we'll, we'll see Paul mentioning, hey, I went here and I got this person off here, and you'll be able to cross-reference that with something in Acts, and then there'll be some extra biblical source that confirms this thing over here. And so you can piece together actually a lot of Paul's journeys and sort of what was happening in that early church period by doing a deep dive into that area. So we're going to take the next three hours of that. Okay. So <laughs> That's a good area for further study. Um, but you'll see him popping up a lot in Acts. Of course, he wrote 13 of the books of the New Testament, all different letters. He didn't write the most content-wise of the New Testament. That prize belongs to Luke, because he wrote Luke and Acts, and that's just a lot of stuff. But Paul was pretty prolific in his writings, wrote a lot of different letters. Uh, we think that there are a lot of letters that he wrote that we don't have, um, but we have at least 13 of the ones that he did. And he was likely martyred in Rome under Air Emperor Nero. That seems to be pretty well substantiated in history. So that's Paul. Now we're moving on to the person he wrote to, Titus, the audience. But who is Titus? What do we know about him? Well, we actually know, a, again, a pretty good deal about Titus. He's not quite as well known as Paul but he does show up everywhere. The verse itself calls Titus Paul's true child in um, a common faith. And a lot of people think that Paul had a hand in Titus's conversion. Um, in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul calls Titus his partner and fellow worker. And he seems to have been one of Paul's reliable uh, fellow missionary workers. And uh, also in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul reminds the Corinthian believers that Titus didn't take advantage of them when he was among them. And so we have, again, these specific mentions of Paul working closely with Titus and Titus and Paul knowing Titus's character, which is pretty cool. Some other cool facts about Titus. He is a Gentile convert. Uh, he was first mentioned chronologically in Galatians. And uh, what's interesting about that is they are on their way to Jerusalem so Titus, Paul, and Barnabas, in order to sort of get involved in the controversy regarding Gentiles in the Jerusalem church. And they were saying, hey, we don't know what to do with these Gentiles. They're common to faith, but we're Jewish. So do Gentiles need to become Jews in order to become Christians? And they were like, I don't know. I don't know. They were like, we don't know. They have to be circumcised. <laughs> so... Exactly. So the, the debate was, do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to follow all the Old Testament regulations? All, all of the jazz. Now, Titus did not become circumcised. And he was one of the voices sort of who was there and present and helped to pave the way so that we Gentiles today know that we are not held by the Old Testament law, that we are free uh, under Christ's law. Um, and they were able to sort of he was able to be potentially influential in the, that decision. Now, he is not mentioned in the book of Acts. However, he does seem to have traveled about with Paul. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8 alludes to how Paul commissioned him to organize a collection for the saints there in Corinth. Um, he seems to have had a, a bit of a stronger personality than T Timothy, uh, who was one of Paul's people who does show up again repeatedly. Uh, Titus also seems to have some sort of uh, administrative ability. Again, we see that uh, both in the book of Titus and then in other places where he pops up. Now, after he started taking up the collection, there seems to be of some seems to have been something in that process that paused the collection taking, and then Paul sent Titus back to encourage the Corinthians to hey finish what you started, go and do the thing that you, you said you were going to do. Then, between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, scholars believe that there is a lost letter of rebuke. So Paul really handed it to them good and hard, and we don't have that letter. There, there just seems to be, there seem to be things that 2 Corinthians is responding to that aren't in 1 Corinthians. That they just, there seems to be a gap. So it's believed that Titus carried that lost letter to the Corinthian believers. And after the Corinthians repented, as we see in 2 Corinthians, uh, he eventually rejoined Paul at Macedonia. Now we do know that he delivered the book of 2 Corinthians to many Corinthians 
the long way, to the Corinthian believers. Uh, it's al also possible that he accompanied Paul to Crete after Paul is released from Roman imprisonment. And again, we'll talk about that in just a second when we talk about the date. Uh, he may have gotten commissioned later to go to Dalmatia. In 2 Timothy, Paul mentions that Titus has been in Dalmatia. We don't know specifically at one point, what point it was, but 2 Timothy was, we believe, the last book that Paul wrote. So it seems that close to the end of Paul's reign, Titus was in Dalmatia. Now, a uh, church historian Eusebius wrote that Titus returned to Crete later and led the church there until he got really old. It's funny, it was, the, the note was specifically until old age, not until death, and I was like, so what do you do for his last couple of years? You know, like, go, go on a sailing expedition? I don't know. But until he finished his race as well. So it's possible, uh, that's an extra biblical source, so we don't, we don't know for sure, but just because it's not in scripture doesn't mean we can't trust it. We trust a lot of things that are in history, so it does seem that he returned to Crete to finish off his sort of lifelong missionary journeys there. Now, talk about dating. When did this happen? When did this happen? Uh, basically, probably around 66, 67. What? You said, let's that talk about dating. I was like, dating? Okay, let's talk about dating. No, 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 look, I know that Valentine's Day is yesterday. We're not going to talk about it. Okay, that's a taboo subject. We're in the Bible study. We don't care about it. Um, so, not here, I don't. <laughs> um, so, Paul converted around 33, 34, 35, 36. AD, and yes, I know that theoretically you're supposed to say AD 26, yeah, but it's just, it's in there, I'm sorry. So, and he was martyred probably around 68 AD, again under Emperor Nero, so Emperor Nero died in 69 AD, so it had to have been before that, it's close to the end, so mm -hmm. probably around 68. Um, so that's sort of the time frame, the initial time frame that we're working with. Now notice, if you guys want to cast your minds all the way back to Ruth, those of you who are, who are here, if you remember, our time frame for Ruth was like hundreds of, and hundreds of years. And we were like, it could be anywhere, mm -hmm. anywhere in, in this large gap of time that Ruth happened and then was recorded. And we don't, we don't know. So already we're down to a good 30 years, which is great. We're pretty, pretty zeroed in. This is pretty accurate. Um, we can use, again, the book of Acts and the different letters to sort of narrowed down when they visited Crete because verse 5 says after I left you in Crete so we know this was written sometime after he left Titus in Crete mm -hmm. so from again the records of Paul's journeys we know that he visited Crete um, on his way to Rome to be imprisoned for the first time he had two imprisonments in Rome now it seems implausible that this would be the time that's being referenced because He's on his way to be in prison, so sort of awkward. You're like, hey, can we just stop by and grab my buddy Titus? I want to. I wanted to plant a church over here. It probably <laughs> didn't happen. However, on the way back, it's very possible that he stopped in Crete again after he was released from prison. He spent two years in prison and then ended up going back to Rome. Um, that he did stop at Crete and left Titus there to consolidate all of the church leadership. And that's sort of when, when he's right here. Um, I could, I was, I was tempted to spend like 15 minutes talking about all of the dating, and then I was like, you know what? If you, if this interests you, just <laughs> dive into the resources and and do a deep dive into the dating of Titus, because there's a lot of there's a lot of cross references. However, I'm going to sum it up by saying. Scholars believe that this was written around 66 to 67 AD. There we go. All right. So this leads us into why did Paul write? Why indeed? Um, whenever we talk about why an author wrote, we want to think about three things. We want to think about the historical occasion, the natural events that were happening around them to prompt the author to write. We want to think about the purpose, the, the why, and then look at the actual what. What's the message? So we're going to take a look at each of those and then finish that up. So historical occasion. Again, he left Titus behind to establish church leadership. And so he was like, 
Apparently. You know, I didn't tell Titus what to do with those leaders, but I don't think I gave him enough details. I better write him. And so he wrote him a letter and said, hey, you know, I'm leaving you in charge, and these are the things that I forgot to tell you or that I need to emphasize to you to make sure that you are equipped with what you need in order to uh, act adequately equip these churches. So the purpose then is seems to be threefold. Uh, first of all, instruct on the how to establish that church leadership. He says, hey, don't just go pick this guy over here because he's good with money and this dude over here because he's got a really loud voice. No, 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 I've got some other things that we want to think about whenever we're establishing leadership because I want you to establish these leaders in every city. So this is how you should do it. Along the way, Paul wants uh, him to, uh, his purpose is to provide details on sound and solid doctrine. There's a lot of false teaching that's going around, that's flying around, and he says, hey, here are some things that I want you to keep in mind. And uh, this is, again, why I'm writing so that you can be equipped to defend yourself against all of that teaching that is terrible. So do it. And finally, he is exhorting Titus and, of course, the congregations who will also be reading the letter to good works. And the title of our study is, of course, Doing Good. Chip Ingram really hones in on this, and I think that it is an accurate summation of the thrust of what Titus is talking about. Now, when we're thinking about the message, again, it is similar to the purpose, but the purpose is the why, the message is the what. So in Titus, we read, establish solid leadership, establish sound doctrine, and do good. Now, you say, well, how do you come to the conclusion that Paul's purpose was this and his message is this? Well, you just take the book and you read it like 50 times. And so uh, if, we, if you were in James, we talked about doing inductive study where you go through and you do highlights and you sort of look for repeated words. And those are things that you can do to help you see patterns, see themes, um, doing good appears over and over and over, doing good works over and over again in the book of Titus. And so that is what our focus will be for the next eight weeks. So that's our intro to the book of Titus. But now I'm going to introduce you to the Chicken Room book. Alrighty. So, as we saw in the Chip, Chip Ingram intro thing, there are a few different sections. I'm going to talk about what each section is in the context of how each week will run. So, whenever we show up next week, so ignore ignore the, the initial thing for a second. So next week we're gonna show up and we're going to watch the first video for the Chip Ingram study. There's a section where you can take notes and fill in the blanks, sort of help you track along as you're watching. If this one, there are fewer note spots, but you can, you can certainly write things down as you go through. Then, turn the page, there's the talk it over section. Um, and this one is page 13. Subtract two, if you're in the subtract group. Subtract. 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 We will discuss these questions. Turn the page. Then there are live it out or bio questions. Be come before God. I do life in community and O be on mission. So it sort of helps you. We'll have this every time. Um, we will also discuss these questions, at least some of them. Those are going to be the discussion questions. We're going to encourage you to preview these questions so that you don't come going, oh, that's a hard question. I, need to, I have to think about that, but I have to also answer. I'm just not going to say anything because that's what I do. I'm like, I, just, I, don't, I don't have time to both think about this and share it. So it, it's helpful if you think about these ahead of time, go through, at least get something in your head if you don't write it down um, so you can sort of have something in mind so that you can even share it with your group. Um, then the homework for the next week will be the accelerate section, which is 20 minutes that turns concepts into convictions. I was like, I'm reading fine upside down. No longer. Okay. 
Um, and this is a section that gets you a little bit deeper into God's word, gives you time to reflect and sort of apply the concepts a little bit more deeply. This then will be the opener, the opening activity for the following week. We will say, hey, so we're, we're going to pick something from the accelerate section to talk about. Hey, and we'll let you know at that the prior week what specific question we're going to go over or what questions. And we'll say, hey, turn to somebody next to you or turn to somebody in your group and go ahead and talk about the accelerate question. So everything except for the video notes will get discussed at some point. Now, do you have to do any of this? Can you just come watch the video and participate in discussion? Yes, you, you certainly can. Um, as the introduction says, the, this is how to get the most out of this experience. You can certainly get out whatever your, your life allows for, whatever you want to get, to get out of this. Um, my, from my personal experience, the more time you spend in God's word, the more vulnerable you're willing to be with yourself and with each other, um, and the more sort of prep time you put in, the more you will get out and the more we will all get out of being in a group with each other. But this is not class. I'm not coming around and checking your books. So if you are like, hey, I thought about the questions, but I didn't write the answer down, I don't care. Like, I don't care. Nobody cares. So do what, do what works for you. We want to glad you're all here. This isn't, it's called homework because it's a shortcut, but it's not homework. It's just an opportunity for you to get into God's word. Speaking of quote unquote homework, we are also going to be providing up there on the chairs. The navigators have a study on the book of Titus as well. Uh, we're going to provide, this is just again an opportunity. We're not going to discuss this material. This is just if you would like to go deeper. Um, each week we'll have a, hey, if you want this, this has some information, a couple of questions for you to think. You're welcome to grab it. You're welcome to go through it, but you don't have to. If going through this prompts questions, you can feel free to, to ask the questions about it. But again, we're not planning to go over this with any of our discussion time. This is just an extra resource for you if you so desire it. Now, I mentioned that we, that you know, there's there's certain things that are sort of like, hey, if you want to get more out of it, you can. You can do this. We do have some sort of general. Um, this is this is I guess expectations is a good way to think about it. For me. My expectation for myself is that I will start at 7 and I will end at 8.30. We have a lot of kids, a lot of people who have kids that are being babysat, who have early bedtimes, and I know a lot of you are, you know, cutting time out of your schedule to, to be here. So if you walk in late, that's okay, no problem, but I will start right at 7. So if you're like, oh, well, I'm always going to be three minutes late. You're always going to be three minutes late. I get that. Life happens. But I will, I will start right at 7 for those who need to... We're like, I need a, um, I'm not, and who need to then get out. That's exactly. I understand exactly. that. That's what's scary. <laughs> That's even. Um, and then we will we will end as close to 8:30 as humanly possible. Now, announcement: We are going to be breaking into. This is a large group. We are going to be splitting into small groups for discussion. We're basically breaking the group about in half. Now, if you're like, oh my gosh, Mariah, I wasn't anticipating this. Please don't put me with this person. <laughs> or please do put me with this person. <coughs> Come and see me. <laughs> Shoot me a text message. Send me an email. And if there are, if there are weird, weird requests, then not that they're weird, but you know, you know, sometimes you, you just have a special connection with someone. You're like, I'm new. I don't know. I don't know anybody. Please don't put me with this person. That's fine. Just let us know. Uh, there's, that's not a problem. We just need to make it smaller because it's hard to have really deep conversations with people when there's like 20 in a room. It's even harder when there are 30. <laughs> so I'm like, it's more than eight. <laughs> eight, that's all I got. Um, so we will be breaking into down to smaller groups. I don't know why I said that. Regardless, so in the small groups, we will also try be trying to end 8.30. So that's going to be us two. Well, one more time. Uh, for everybody, we have an expectation of confidentiality, uh, what's said here stays here. Um, of course, if there's ever something where you find out that somebody's being abused or whatever, like something that's like, I should talk, I should call 911 or something like that, you know, this person needs to talk to a pastor right away, whatever. So there are exceptional circumstances. Otherwise, what's said here stays here. We'll get out there. Third round of COVID. <laughs> 
what you put in. So um, my expectation, again, this is one for myself, is that I will come prepared. Mm -hmm. If um, I come and I'm not prepared, you should fire me. So, um, but for you guys, again, it, this is a come to the level of preparedness that is that you feel like like you want to put into the study. Mm -hmm. Now, if you come to me and you say, Mariah, I want to be this level of prepared, and you and you, then you come up and you're. If you want to be this level of prepared and you're this level of prepared, then I will tell you, hey, you said you wanted to be here and you're, you know, here. But if you say, I'm coming in with the C and I'm, I'm hitting that C mark, then that's what, and that's what the expectation for you. Good. <laughs> Keep going. Now, in the discussion groups, whenever we're doing our discussion questions, these are not fix-it sessions. So if you're like, oh, I know exactly what you need to do to solve your problem. Save it for a coffee date later and say, hey, would you be, I've, you know, been through something similar. Would you be open to having, you know, a, a further conversation about this? But in our discussion groups, they're more for exploring application and thinking about specific principles, not a, I'm going, to, we're all going to in the group collectively claw our way down somebody's throat and tell them what you need to do to solve your problems. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, they, they're not therapy sessions. So now sometimes, sometimes a discussion group, question will just pull something out that's just like and you just you have a little you have a breakdown and that that happens sometimes so if that happens don't feel like oh i'm, I'm ruining the group experience no that's okay that's okay but what it, it should, we should not be is no my life is just terrible <laughs> everything is terrible and and nothing is good um remember so what we're here to do is we're going to study god's words so that we can apply to our lives so that we can grow and so that we can change um, not so that we can take out our pity, pity party tape and press play again for each new person that we come in contact with. Here, for you, like, ready to hear it again? So, um, just, uh, sort of, we're, we're somewhere in between those two extremes. That's what we're aiming for with the group. Again, sometimes there'll be a very specific situation that comes up and it's appropriate to address it at that time, but that's sort of the goal for our discussion group questions. Um, so our challenge, those of us who have been with our studies before know we like we do like to have a challenge again that for the following week there will always be something out of the accelerate section, but we don't have an accelerate section for this week. So our challenge for this week is going to be to read through the book of Titus if you have not done so already. If you have done so already, do it again. <laughs> uh, the more we're in God's word, the better. And um, what we would like to challenge again everybody to do is to write down one thing, bring it ready to share that stands out from your read through of the book. Now, if you could all come back and say, wow, I was really struck by how many times he talked about doing good works. I mean, that's an acceptable answer, but um, if that's what stands out to you. So um, you don't have to think, I have to make it unique somehow. Just bring something that, that stands out to you. Homework. And then preview our discussion questions for next week, which will be the talk it over questions on page 13. Subtract two pages for those who have a special book. And then the live it out sections, or the bio section, uh, which is pages 14 through 15. Again, special people. Subtract two. So. Did you want to drop something? What? Uh, Marker drop.